Hello. Well, it's Writing Wednesday live from New York City. Uh, I'm here this week. Uh, there's Poets and Writers, an organization that I uh, uh, am so grateful to and has made such a difference in my life. Has its big fundraiser uh, tonight. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what it was like to be a writer from the outside who had no one and nowhere and how poets and writers really stepped in for me. So I'll be uh, giving a little pitch. And uh, I urge everybody who is interested in finding out more about writing to go on to Poets and Writers, uh, pw.org. Uh, when, when I was a typesetter back in the day and I didn't know any writers and I had no entree into field and I had never done a, you know, I have no degree, I didn't do a program, um, Poets and Writers was really the entree to the field. So um, I'm here, I come every year to support poets and writers, and I urge you guys to do the same, pw.org. So here I am in New York. This is my hotel. I'm uh, staying at the Redbury. This is the restaurant, which is awesome. I'm changing rooms because writers need light, and uh, the quiet room with the view of the air shaft just doesn't make it. So changing rooms, that's why I'm camped out in the bar, uh, which is a wonderful place to camp out. Uh, I guess I did ask people for questions because I knew I'd be doing this on the fly, so let me answer people's questions first. Okay, we had questions uh, this week from, here's a question from Susan Barlow, what's your creative process when beginning a new project? How do you start, when do you get stuck, and what gets you to the finish line? So I've talked about a lot of this stuff in the various videos, this is a big question. Uh, so I'm going to ask answer uh, a little bit of this um, creative process to begin a new project. I try little things. I sniff around. I try to find something that seems not to have been completed, even if I'd written a story from it. Something that's bothering me. And um, writers work on obsession, and uh, I try to find the thing that I can't stop thinking about. A character usually. Uh, with a kind of a certain kind of existential problem and uh, I move from there. Um, I start a lot of different things and then wait till I find the thing that really speaks to me that seems to have the energy that's going to sustain me for quite some time. Uh, I get stuck when I run out of what I know about the character and I have to stop and interview the character, sometimes interview other characters, um, and basically kind of, it's sort of like creative visualization, and find, find out what I don't know about these characters, that it's not, you know, I have to understand them on a deeper level, I have to learn more about them. Um, what gets you to the finish line? Um, besides exhaustion, uh, what gets me to the finish line is um, the work doesn't really exist until it's done and out in the world. I, I can't stand to see a, a project that isn't done. Um, my nickname in my family was Bulldog, and that's what I am. Is I just can't stand to see an, an, something that is you put all that energy into and it never makes its way out into the world. Um, so that's uh, Susanna's question. I hope that helps a little bit. Then I've got uh, a question by uh, Linda Harrison. Uh, how about your thoughts on the dangers of using reading as a tool to avoid writing? Um, when do I know I've read enough and am equipped to start writing? Well, it's, did I read enough this morning, or did I read enough? You read while you're working, if you're a working writer, because you're always going to be reading and you're always going to be writing. So you need to know when to stop that day, uh, 
you'll notice that there's a point that you get very excited as you're reading and you really want to start writing and then there's a point where you the excitement starts to fall off stop right there stop when the excitement that you makes you want to go write drops off and then go and start writing um, so that's how you know if you've read enough when have you read enough to begin writing as a writer um, there's no that doesn't exist you know you always have to keep reading um, and your writing will be as good as what you're reading for sure and what you've read um, but um, I think that don't try to prepare and then write you know read while you're writing read only the best stuff um, God I've started reading um, uh, Anita Bruckner's Brief Lives and my God that woman writes that's the most beautiful, mature prose I have seen in a long time. She writes almost like Graham Greene. Uh, mature uh, uh, writing style, just beautiful. So, but during the day, you know, read until you feel that excitement build, and then use the excitement. Don't let it fade away. Here is another question. Um, this is Hannah. Oh, what did I just do? little equipment stuff. Uh, Hannah, how can writers in college with limited budgets get involved? My second book was just accepted for publishing. Congratulations. And I'd like to get more involved with the writing community. But I'm only 19 and finishing up my first year in college. Sounds great. So I don't have a lot of money to go to writing conferences or seminars. A lot of them have scholarships. And if you are already publishing, my guess is that they're going to feel like, oh, this would be a good candidate of someone we could give a scholarship to. So never not apply to something because you don't have the money. First apply when you get in, then you can say, I don't have the money, can you help me? Um, how can I get my name out there? That's a whole different question. Um, poets and writers, poets and writers, read poets and writers. Um, how do I get my name out there to acquire more readers? That's that's business. That's supports and writers, um, as well to hopefully help other writers who are still struggling to get published. Uh, just keep writing. Um, dying to connect more. Well, I have a writing group. I uh, started this writing. Well, we we started this group. It was a bunch of second second novelists. Only four of us. Second novelists who were always. Um, like, how's it going? Oh, great! How's it going? Great! And then it was like suddenly we all copped to the fact that it wasn't going great, and we thought, oh, we should have a writing room. And I've been meeting with them for years. We meet every Wednesday. And the nice thing about taking classes, even extension is not expensive, meet up, you know, even meetups, even anything, um, is notice whose work you respect whose commentary you respect and say would you like a, to make a group up and that doesn't have to be more than two people three people, four people when it gets bigger it's you might get be getting people that you're not really interested in in their comments <coughs> excuse me traveler's cough but definitely the connection is good so connect up with people if you're in, if you're in college there's got to be writers, you know, put something up somewhere or have an open mic or figure out a way to connect with people at your school. That's why you're going to school. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, wondering how you feel about writers, how writers gain or earn the authority or artistic license to write about subjects they personally have not lived or known. Okay. That's 100% of all writers. Generally speaking, people who write about what they know are called memoirists. People who write about, who extend their, <coughs> oh God, what a time. People who extend their imagination into the lives of other people write fiction. And when you're writing about people very, very different from you or experiences that you have not personally had, you have a burden to make sure you get it right. You have to do the research. You have to 
make sure that, say, if you're writing about a person of a different ethnicity or different gender, you give it to them, somebody you know who's of that ethnicity or gender, and you say, how'd I do? Am I getting it right? What am I missing? Try to get some get details. So research, even in fiction, you do research to make sure you get you have a burden to get it right. Otherwise, that's why we write fiction, because writing about ourselves is boring. Um, so that's Brett. That's your question. Then we have um, Andrea Belt. When writing about a character, do you have a clear idea of how they look in your mind? Do you have do you base them on others' appearance? It is a small detail, but I've always wanted to know. Yes. I often, often, often will pick an actor or actress who reminds me of that character. Um, and then I can watch a movie, notice their gestures, notice their facial expression, notice the way they walk, the way they carry themselves, um, or a couple of different people. Often it's somebody I know, plus this actress, plus this actress, plus this actress. Or, uh, so I get kind of a cross-section, but the reader puts it all together in their minds. So I have a whole, I always have pictures of all of the characters that I refer to constantly. And there might be three actresses, but they're all Vera Borisovna, or they're all Marina, or they're all... Um, Kolya, and I refer to that. Very, very helpful. Um, so, <coughs> boy, I'm going to speak tonight at that dinner with his cough. Oh, that's going to be fun. Do you ever have, this is Joe Beth, do you ever have one character or scene that drives you bonkers? Something important that you know is key and can't be chopped or danced around. Oh, oh, oh. I'm editing my uh, second, the second book right now, and I have one scene that my editor had a problem with a certain aspect, but because everything is knit together, it was very, very difficult to screw with it because the scene not, is not only that scene and the, the problem of that scene, but if my book is a symphony and I take out say this dark note here, then it throws everything else off. You have two bright pieces and a, without the dark note, you've thrown off the melody. So I have to figure out how to make that scene work. And you do it, you come back, you do it, you come back, but a writer operates on their, on their stomach. If it makes you queasy, it's not their work and it just sits in your stomach like an undigested meal. And I try everything. I go away and I come back. I try it in a different way. I try a different voice that may be helpful uh, diff from a different point of view. There's a lot of dialogue. I might take all the dialogue out, write it as a deeply internal scene. If that doesn't seem to have enough action, I'll try something else. Yeah, I keep trying until I find something that is mostly what I want and then I'll probably have to come back and go over it again. Uh, writing is nothing but this kind of stuff. Um, what else do you have? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, here's a lovely question by uh, Reina Zada. How do you celebrate once you've finally completed your manuscript? Do you find yourself feeling like you can do anything? Is it like the cat that just used the litter box and tends to run around like a spaz at the sheer joy of having emptied its bowels? Okay, that's more than one question. All right. Usually the way it works is the sale of the manuscript is the jumping on the bed. That's where you jump up and down on the bed and scream, going, yeah, 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 you play Talk of the Town. That's my go-to song. Talk of the Town by the Tr Pretenders. Just feel really great. But just finishing a manuscript, what you have to be careful of, if you're a worrier, like, frankly, most writers are worriers, we're obsessive, um, is you know you're not done. 
you know that there's going to be problems, there's going to be rewrites. Um, and the trick is to celebrate. I learned this from my husband. He says, if you don't celebrate prematurely, uh, you'll never taste champagne. So celebrate at every stage instead of worrying, I'm not done yet because blah, blah, blah is coming. Just celebrate. Why not? Uh, but jumping on the bed when you sell the manuscript, when you get the agent, er, er, you know, all of the big things, jumping on the bed. Then when, you f when the book comes out or is, about, is going to be coming out, there's a lot of publicity stuff and you have to be careful not to get too subsumed in what's coming and enjoy what is. Also, when the book comes out, you celebrate and you stay off of other people's successes. Because, you know, however successful your book is, somebody else is going to have a more successful book. If you, you know, are long-listed for the, for the Pulitzer or long-listed for the Man Booker, somebody else will be short-listed and somebody else will win it. So just stay off of other people and enjoy your own day drinking. <laughs> so, so it's um, uh, celebrate when you can and really concentrate on the blessings of the universe coming your way. And try not to look to other people and see what they're doing. Uh, that way lies madness. Let's see, what else have people asked? Go ahead and ask me questions, because I'm here, sitting in a bar and I'm at your service here. Um, uh, what else did we have? Um, you find yourself feeling like you can do everything, no. I feel like I need a transfusion. I feel like I need a personal trainer and a dietitian and um, a spiritual healer. And um, yeah, no, I feel like um, comatose after I finish a manuscript. There is none of these things that you think. And the temptation is to get to work on all the things you've neglected. Um, the uh, water coming into the garage, the broken, you know, the broken dishwasher, all the things that you've let go for the last five, six, seven years. Um, don't get right to work, you know, sleep late. Um, and the thing that I want to do is just read for pleasure, just read for days and days and days. Uh, that is really fun. So here I am in New York, and it's... Um, Always a working vacation. Uh, writers never take vacations. I don't know if anybody knows this. We always are working on vacation, and it's not just for the write-off. Um, it's just because the brain is always working, and uh, I have my writer's notebook. I keep a notebook for travel that is uh, big enough that I can sketch and paint in it, as well as uh, as well as write in it, and you just. You know, just to keep the impressions um, of what you're seeing, you never, you never stop having a consciousness while you're while you're traveling. So always keep your eye out um, when the the surrealists always had were big on games to kind of cleanse the eyes and cleanse the sensibility. Um, and one of the things that they used to do is go out in search of the miraculous. And when you're looking for the miraculous, it can be anything. It can be a leaf that fell into the wet concrete and left its impression. It, uh, I keep seeing all these incredible uh, people. There was a girl in the Murray Hill Diner today who was uh, had a jacket that said, "Love is, a, I dream, yes, I dream of you in in colors that don't exist." She had painted on the back of her camo jacket. It was the most glorious thing. Uh, two people kissing on a corner. It can be anything. Keep your eyes open when you're traveling. Um, my favorite places in New York are um, 
I like to go to Poet's House, uh, which is in the uh, Battery on the tip of New York. There is a 50,000 volume poetry library that's free. And I go in there at least once every trip to New York and just chill on an afternoon. It's sunny. You pick a book at random off the shelf, and here is your new favorite poet. Um, it is a fabulous place. Another place I love, uh, there's always an exhibition at New York Public Library. They have a big uh, counterculture show right now that we, we happened into just by chance. There's something, just follow the flow. Uh, in New York, it's the streets are paved with miracles. Um, here's a question. Would you mind telling us some of the actors that served as imp imp inspiration for Marina or Josie? I could. I could. Marina, uh, there's an actress that... Um, I had Marina in my head, but I was watching The Born Identity, and I saw that actress who played the, the girl, uh, the German girl, and I was like, oh, it's Marina. So she's somebody that I, I think of Marina in that way. And I also think of Marina um, a bit uh, of Vanessa Redgrave and uh, The Loves of Isadora. Um, there are a lot of Bella Ahmadalina, who was a redheaded poet in, from the 50s, one of my very favorite mid era Soviet poets. Um, is also a little bit of Marina, and then Marina Svetaeva, uh, although she didn't look anything like her, her temperament was very Marina. So those are some of the Marinas. And Josie, um, I've got to say Josie is somebody I know, and that was uh, taken after her. Um, let's see, what else can I answer? Go ahead and ask me, I'm right, I'm right on you. Um, so favorite places in New York. I love the Rurik Museum, R-O-E-R-I-K. He was a Russian pre-revolutionary and revolutionary era artist. And he was of a piece, if you've read uh, The Revolution of Marina M, very much of a piece of, of Ukashian world, um, the, spiritual, the spiritualism of that pre-revolutionary uh, generation, the world of art, the uh, uh, theosophists and anthroposophists. And, uh, uh, but the Nikolai Rurik uh, House Museum is on 105th at West End, and it is, it's a brownstone, all three stories, with his beautiful, beautiful spiritual art. And if you want to get a feel for Ionian, Ukashian, and all that, uh, where the mother was coming from, Absolutely. Uh, it's another wonderful place to get away from the noise and the uh, run around of New what, run around. I love New York. Um, but it's nice you need to chill out. So Poets House, Rurik Museum. I definitely always go to New York Public. The um, J.P. Morgan Library has amazing, always has amazing shows um, uh, of a literary nature. Uh, way, way worth going to. Um, ending all the chapters of my work in progress with a line of dialogue is there a point where that becomes repetitive if you are noticing if you are noticing that you are repeating that pull back a little bit have somebody say something and then pull back and do a little bit of landscape because if you are noticing it then it is repetitive absolutely um the same punch in the same place will start, people will start, a try, will notice, you'll start to notice. Have you ever lost your desire to write? Full loss of inspiration, all that goes on with it. How do you bring it back? Um, I think that I, I write whether I'm inspired or not, and then let inspiration come back to me as I'm working. Um, if I'm feeling uninspired, I often read something that always inspires me, uh, and um, I'll do exercises, go back to kind of the unconscious, um, 
and see what comes up when I'm writing from a photograph or I'm writing from um, an object. Uh, you need to find the place you reconnect to yourself. Um, rereading fathers and sons, or fathers and children, actually, in the Russian. Um, what was going on at the time when Turgenev wrote it? 1870s? 1870s? It's post-Decemberist. Post- post-Decemberist. Well, obviously it was a nihilistic generation, because Bazarov is, is a nihilist. So, Dostoevsky, Turgenev. Turgenev had a very elegant style. We share a birthday. Yep. Um, so, it's a revolutionary generation as well, you know, and uh, Fathers Against Children, just as Marina's generation, the parents and the children were very much at odds. They were living in a different, completely different world. Do you have any thoughts on the artist's way? Um, I know people who do it, uh, who have done it. I even saw it in the store the other day and thought, hmm, I've never done that. You have to be very careful if you are writing fiction or writing, becoming a, an artist, um, that you don't back off too much from the actual writing. Um, I've written about that before. You know, be careful of superstition. Be careful of over journaling, because you want to save that juice for your fiction writing. So, if you do something like the artist's way, make sure it's not taking too much of your creative time. It might be a good thing to do between pro. If you finish a novel and want to refresh yourself a little bit, that might be a good time to do it. But. Figure you are enough, you know enough, you, you know, if you need to control your procrastination or something like that, make sure it, you're not adding to the procrastination by adding another thing you have to do before you can write. So I think it's probably awesome, but think about putting that time into your work. That's an idea. Over journaling. Yeah. Yeah, it's where you spend all your time analyzing your dreams and stuff like that, and, and then when you sit down to write, you just don't have any juice left. Take the cream on the coffee, the cream on the milk, and use that for your creative work. Um, so that's, as, as somebody who does journal, I have to be really careful about that. Um, let's see, so... What do I like about New York? You know, New York is, I, I am so stimulated by walking around the streets and seeing people and seeing the faces and seeing the layers of New York, old, older, older, brand new, next century. I see the art, I see the, you know, plays. Um, but everything is so concentrated here. And uh, I just, I just love, I feel very, like, more awake here. I feel smarter here. I feel more reactive. Um, and maybe if I lived here, I, I would start blurring over. Uh, but I don't know. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, it's a, um, a place that values art and values thought and values writing and uh, the literary arts. So... I think if I lived here, maybe I'd be a little too concerned with my fellow writers and uh, trying to, there might be a little more competitive air, which I don't know if we need people breathing down our necks that hard. Um, have I seen Hamilton? Yes. Yeah, I saw the Pantages in LA. That was awesome. Um, I mean, there are some taking a story and recontextualizing it. Um, which is an interesting, interesting approach to fiction. Um, let's see, what else? I've, um, I come here every year. It's, um, for me, being in touch with what's going on in New York, also often writers from other places in the country go, how, why is New York is New York important? 
Do we need to care what New York does anymore? Um, yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to say that there was a book I had that didn't get reviewed very much, and I asked a friend who lives here in New York, and everybody's saying, oh, it doesn't make any difference if you live in New York or not. And he said, um, I'm giving half of it away, half the world. And he said, well, you don't live in New York, so if it's a choice between reviewing you and reviewing somebody that people see uh, at parties four times a week, they're going to review the person they see at parties four times a week, and that's the truth. So I make an effort to drag my... It's not dragging my ass, I love it here. Uh, but I do make an effort to come here once a year and make sure that I exist in the eyes of new, you know, people in New York. And uh, it's nice, it's making friends. Uh, a lot of people move back and forth, and you see them on book tour, you see them at the book festivals. So, uh, it's sort of a... F literature's a floating crap game, you know, it's a movable feast, and uh, it exists everywhere. Even in the small, well, the smallest towns, you, you get it online. Um, and in Poets and Writers magazine. And don't hesitate to write to writers that you like, but don't ask them questions that you already can find out the answers to other, like how do you get an agent? Poets and Writers. When you contact a writer, ask a question about their book. And they're far more likely to be interested in answer, and you get a correspondence going, you know. I did, never did that when I was living in Podunk, but uh, uh, it's uh, somebody should tell me uh, that writers uh, were all in isolation. And getting a nice note from somebody who's read your book, there's nothing like it. Um, how does photography inspire your writing? I love the visual arts. Um, all the arts play together. Um, I'm especially interested in photography, um, and uh, I use it constantly. Uh, if I have to write about a place, if I have to write about a person, a mood, I'd find a photograph with that mood, and I try to write my way into the photograph. Um, I do that as an exercise all the time. So I collect photo books that have photographs with a number of different emotions uh, involved. Uh, the, the Family of Man is a really good one to own because it, uh, it's a photo exhibit that was curated in, after the war, after World War II, by Edward Steichen, one of the great American photographers. It traveled all around the world. It was under the aegis of uh, the UN. And it has every emotion. It's, con it's, it's about human life and the cycles of life uh, told through the lens of people from 104 countries. So marriage, courtship, childbirth, uh, war, anger, you know, all the emotions. And uh, pick one of those photographs and start writing your way into it. Um, that's incredible. Uh, I can't come to Barnes & Noble Union Square. I'm going to the Poets and Writers dinner. That's why I'm here. So support Poets and Writers. Read it. Uh, PW.org. Um, and um, it's going to be fun. And uh, next week I'll be in an airport somewhere. So I might have to do this broadcast early. But I wanted to hit it. And... Uh, um, so I wish you good writing. Do you think it's necessary? Well, here's a really good question. Do you think it's necessary for writers to have a routine to write every day? Absolutely. Anytime you can get into a habit that can push the train up the hill for you, uh, go ahead. Um, I think that even if you don't aren't successful in following a routine every day, it's just like working out. Um, if that's what you do, you get up, you have a cup of coffee, you have some a peanut butter sandwich, and you start working, you are much more likely to start working every day. Um, so find your routine and do it every day. You know, anybody who's ever taken any medication every other day, you're not going to take it. It's only when you do it every day that you manage to take it. 
uh, if your mornings are disorganized, you manage to take it in the evening. It's just whenever you can find a time that you can do it every day, and then if you blow it off one day, try to make it up later some other time. But yeah, try for an everyday routine. All right, well, uh, I wish you good writing, and uh, hopefully I won't start coughing in the middle of my speech tonight. Uh, so take it easy. Bye.